Hello everybody, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a different guest on each week. We head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry. And we catch up with Twangler Jack Ford over in the Yorkshed for a weekly album review. We also play local unsigned and or independent music. As always, I'd love to hear from you, so you can reach out to me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, people with mp3s stories to share etc etc don't hesitate to get in touch you can also find us on facebook if you search for the art show on wickham sound and we are repeat on wickham sound on monday nights we're on the wickham sound listen again we're on itunes spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts please do leave us a uh, nice little review on your podcast provider of choice so this week we're going to be chatting to local singer-songwriter Eleanor Morrison Moore, but before we do that, we are going to head over to the Rye Light Zone to catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for the latest uh, instalment in his My Musical Journey series. My musical associate Phil Ryan was giving guitar lessons to a Swedish oil executive who suggested they became partners in a West End nightclub for acoustic music, to be named the 12 Bar Club. Phil had been deputy editor of The Big Issue but left that in order to front a band claiming to be the Animals and play at a benefit concert in Moscow Red Square. The keyboard player in that band was my other long-time musical associate, Denny Bertan. The 12 Bar Club in Denmark Street became my second home. I was occasionally the sound man, but best of all I could take guests, sit in the VIP suite and get free drinks. As manager, Phil gave breaks to many of the artists who then owed him a favour. So when we decided to do a musical based on the novel Silas Marner by George Eliot, we had singers willing to help out. For once, the favours for favour system worked in our favour. This also coincided with Phil's literary agent arranging a meeting for him with the producers at the Shaftesbury Theatre. They were interested, so Phil mapped out which songs each of us should write. We recorded them on an 8-track recorder in Phil's flat, using a few of our friends. We had a Commodore Amiga and a sequencer program called Master Tracks. This was synced to an 8-track recorder. We arranged all the tracks like classical pieces. Though all the sounds were made by a Korg M1 synthesizer module, They were representations of piano, string and percussion instruments. Before playing each part on the keyboard, Denny would mime the way each instrument should be played, bowing imaginary cellos and beating imaginary timpani. Producers suggested a few more songs to finish it off. I was tasked with writing the scene where the real father wants to take back his daughter, but she chooses to stay with Silas. For part of it I wrote a lyric to a tune that Phil had written, but we had not so far used. Pardon me is cautious, pardon me is keen, with my love put to the test. What shall I do for the best? Come with us, be no jewels in your heart to shine. I have I dreamed no of as this world, but for what I must say, I'm sure in your way. You believe you are kind, but this is my home, and here I must stay.
Some of our best ever songs and meetings were held where names like Jerry Halliwell and Robbie Williams were bandied about, and plans were made to raise millions. The Shaftesbury Theatre were at the time home to the original London production of Rent. One memorable night in the late 90s, Phil Denny and I, with our partners, found ourselves being shown to our complimentary seats by a man who had recently been part of Andrew Lloyd Webber's organisation. We hope to get your musical on here soon, he said. I remember it well. The anticipation was the best thing I have ever known. We would hear tales of optimistic meetings. I was working as a minicab driver and I may just have mentioned it to one or two passengers. All the time, every day. I was having a great time. The streets of London were a pleasure to drive. Traffic jams were just another chance to take stock. I was self-employed. I could drop my passenger and start my new life as a successful songwriter just as soon as I got the word. One day I dropped our latest CDs of the song to the theatre in Shaftesbury Avenue so the producer could fly to New York for a meeting with Jim Dale. Yes, Jim Dale of the Carry On films. But it was not to be. The money went elsewhere. And for years we charted all the failures that were put on at the Shaftesbury Theatre. But we still had contacts at the Theatro Technis in Camden. We called in Phil's 12-bar club favours and put together a cast, including a voice coach and her mother, an ex-professional opera singer. One of our singers was a producer who had worked with post-punk legends The Fall, John Peel's favourite band. Phil was Silas Marner. I was musical director during the rehearsals and I directed the lighting during the performances. By then I was using a PC running Cubase to sequence sound fonts that had been made from samples of the real instruments. The opera singer required a vocal score so I had to work out how to do that as well. We sold out two nights and luckily two of our friends filmed it. Another top producer saw one of the performances and also tried to get funding, but that didn't happen either. We had a meeting backstage at the Wickham Swan. Not quite the Shaftesbury Theatre, but not so far for me to go. However, it did end up with me having a Fender Telecaster. We were also advised to maybe consider writing something modern. We left it for a while and then Phil and I both added some new songs. He picks me up if I should fall He's by my side if I should call He knows me well But I don't know him at all I still believe in the man It's not his way to be cruel Can I believe in someone I barely know at all? But he's my man With all his imperfections He's still my man And he's everything to me I should resent his duplicity 
sympathy, though what I feel is sympathy, though he has sinned, he's no sinner, nor a fool. She's your what child. What shall we do? And though do we have lost time, could love still her too. she's your Could you still child. love someone? And you all don't that's know what is all. This is my love. We'll, we'll work it out together. Still with our love, we have all we'll ever I was listening to a Puccini opera and I was inspired to come up with one verse, to which Phil quickly added four more and two bridges. When you wake at the thought of each day, if you weep for the times there was joy, the lesson is clear, though you don't want to hear, there is no such thing. YouTube had become a thing and I linked all the footage from the Teatro Technis with footage of the new songs and put it all up on a YouTube channel. At one point we had a company in Canada interested. In the mid-2010s we had an inquiry from the Bedlington Light Opera Society. One night in 2016 Phil and I drove into the heart of Surrey to see 26 people in full Victorian costume perform our musical. It was a full house and we took a bow. I was inspired to run my own workshops of Silas Marner at Wickham Art Centre, but I could not find enough singers to put on a production. I finally gave up on Silas Marner after 18 years, during which time I had moved to Wickham. It was finally time to bury the old man. A wonderful life no mad in crowds, no trouble and strife And I'll have a husband if father agrees We'll all be one big family I'll be a mother, daughter and wife A wonderful Big thank you to Twanglin' Jack Ford for this week's entry into the Rye Light Zone. You're listening to the Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Bert Honor with an ode to Orson Welles. Great. 
director said Then he blew it all for fame You're gonna miss me when I'm gone I hope you're not the only one If so, then I'll shoulder the blame Masterpiece, it must be buried incomplete, left to ruin in the rain. It's best the world will never know just how far this man will go, forever burdening the shame. My dirty secrets die with me, a badly written tragedy that just gets worse with every pain. You're listening to the Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And this week we are joined by singer-songwriter Eleanor Morrison-Moore. The first question is one I ask everybody, uh, and it may or may not be relevant to you, but it's what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? Uh, last book that I read was, uh, what's what, it's called Girl A. Oh, I didn't read, really, well, it was good. It, it was good. It was a fiction. I don't often mm-hmm. read, um, it's not really my type of book. It was about a... Uh, girl as a member of siblings who were found locked in a house and they managed to mm-hmm. escape it they were lock, locked up by their parents basically so it's a bit of a weird one for me not normally what i read but uh yeah it was okay i managed to go to the end i'm a bit of a if i don't like something halfway like a little bit in i tend to not bother and i'll put it yeah. down so i've quite often reading about three books at the time but that's the yeah. last one i've completed <laughs> awesome cool uh so obviously i want to chat to you about music today and i thought a good place to start would be to ask uh which instruments do you play and how long have you been playing them so uh my first musical instrument i played other than the recorder was uh, uh viola i started playing viola when i was a I think around about sort of seven uh and i played i went to the music school in hillingdon there was a mm-hmm. uh, london borough music school 
Um, and I used to go there and I played in orchestras there, etc. And also started to learn piano there. So I would, I think I was probably playing viola for around about until I was about 13. So probably around mm -hmm. seven years, I sort of got to a really good level on it. Um, and then like all good 14 year olds abandoned it and got drunk. <laughs> so um, yeah. <laughs> no, um, still having my viola, still need to get back to it. So because I was actually really quite good. <laughs> um, awesome. So that, that was viola, piano. I played only for a few years, really. And again, until that sort of age where I just went out for the next 15 years. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, I played that until about sort of grade three. So I was capable on it. Um, and I've still got a keyboard upstairs. Uh, and then guitar, I've always known three chords, <laughs> like most people. My dad was a really big guitar player. And uh, I eventually picked that up, inspired by the group Open Mics Late, um, mm -hmm. how we've met and lots of other musicians that I've met over the last few years during lockdown. Uh, so I picked that up in January 21 and still going strong, doing more awesome. and more now out gigging on my own. So yeah, love yeah. it. Do you know more than three chords now? I do. I know at least <laughs> 18 now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm not, I'm not saying I can play them all. But... <laughs> well, you know, they exist. Yeah. Well, and I wanted to, I wanted to ask like, so does that that background in um I guess like more classical music, more classical yeah. training and sheet music mm -hmm. and all of that stuff, has that helped you to to pick up the guitar and things like that? Yeah, massively. I think certainly from a fingers point of view, the viola to guitar, yeah. that was a massive help. Um also right hand, left hand doing different things, that sort of stuff, you know. Uh yeah, definitely. And just my understanding of music and music theory, because I did sort of music theory up until I think grade seven. I did all of them, yeah. I'm pretty sure. So yeah, you know, having all of that and because I do singing as well, it helps with my harmonies. It, you know, I've always been a singer as well. So uh yeah, massive part I think helps. Cool. Hugely. Yeah. Awesome. And you mentioned open mic slate. And, and one of the questions I wanted to ask is like, how has the open mic slate help uh, group helped you sort of personally? Um, so weirdly, when I, uh, I moved to Oxfordshire from sort of Wickham Marlow area um, mm -hmm. and uh, in 2017, and very quickly, my husband and I moved here, we broke up very quickly after we'd moved here. And I was kind of left in this place where I didn't really know anybody. Um, mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, 2020 came and lockdown came. And I can remember thinking when they told us to isolate, yeah, I kind of do anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't really know anyone. <laughs> so, um, and uh, all of a sudden, through Open Mic Slate, one of my friends added me to it from Marlowe, Lynn, and... Uh, she knew I'd enjoy it, so she had me on. And then I found, obviously, like a lot of us did, we were chatting to people, and I found lots of people, um, sort of Robert Honor, or Bert Honor, I should say, because mm. he's Bert, we must, we must say Bert, and Kit Goff and Matt Pickett, lots of people that were like in Bista, really local to me. Um, and that just opened up my public network as well. And now, you know, I was only out of the weekend watching Bert and Matt and other guys play that I've come to meet and now gone into starting singing with people locally and what mm -hmm. have you. So it's, for me, uh, it was massive. It's by no means just music. It's been about um, building foundations in my new area, actually. And I'm now to the point where I wouldn't, you couldn't pay me to leave. Whereas yeah. go back three years ago, I was ready to, come back to Marlow and see my mates again you know but, yeah, uh, no yeah. so it's been life it's actually been life changing it's been crazy awesome. cool and um like how much how much do you get about uh gigging and stuff I suppose you know before COVID not so much and then since picking yeah. up the guitar yeah. since then no absolutely so um I don't do it so I will do uh I'll basic probably gig maybe once a month on the guitar uh mm -hmm. be it somewhere or other um i will go to open mics and my main gig in music though it i have to say is with the boogie woogie bellas with the uh harmony trio that i sing with because mm -hmm. we get booked for an awful lot of stuff so that keeps me sometimes a little bit too busy to do my guitar stuff i must say we'll get gigs on the same day and i'm trying to do both or i'm trying yeah. so uh but yeah, I do a lot of stuff with the Far Out crew. Love working with those guys um, and uh, doing anything for them. Did a festival a couple of weeks ago in Tame. So yeah, yeah I'm getting more and more all the time. I really, really enjoy writing and uh, I really, really enjoy going out and doing my own music. And I think that's where I've kind of found my niche over the last six months is uh, stopping with the covers and doing my own stuff. So it's, awesome. Uh, yeah. 
Well, and can you tell us a bit more about the Boogie Woogie Bellas? They're hard to say. I guess uh, they they're, are that's, hard to that's, say. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's all covers, right? Yeah, pretty much. We have started to introduce some of my writing, and we're thinking about going that way, just so we can have mm -hmm. some originals as well. But essentially, we're doing um, sort of 1940s, 50s music, um, Andrew Sisters, stuff like that, the old sweetheart stuff. Um, and then also, similar to the, I uh, don't know if you, I'm sure you will know, Postmodern Jukebox, but taking mm -hmm. modern songs and putting them back into that twist. Um, yeah. And then working on the harmonies together and putting that out and a uh, we get stress up and go and do gigs. It's great fun. You know, we do a lot of work in care homes. We do private parties. We do variety showcases, all sorts of things. So that keeps us very, very busy. Um, and uh, again, the girls are local. It's uh, yeah. one of them I have known for a long time, but the other one only since I've moved here. Um, and uh, yeah, it's really kind of brought things alive musically for me again, I must say. Yeah. And it, I suppose it keeps you in practice as well, especially with, as you say, yeah. like the harmonies, you know, yeah. it's, that's like a muscle you need to keep working at to, to keep it, it is, strong. Yeah. And changing songs, converting songs into a different style and a different beat. Yeah. And a different, I love doing that, you know. Um, so, yeah, we uh, but no, it is, it is heavily all covers, but uh, they go down a treat because they normally takes a couple of minutes to hear a song. And then you're like, oh, my God, it's that one. Um, yeah. Because yeah. we've changed it, taking it away so much from the original, you know. So, uh, yeah, no, it's really good fun, that. Awesome. Cool. And you mentioned uh, the Far Out crew. So um, last time I saw you was at uh, Kimberly's birthday party. So I wondered, That's right. uh, did, did you have fun there? And what were some of the highlights for you? Yeah, I loved it. Um, I was essentially, I think probably highlight for me, as always, is getting together with the guys that I've met through OM. Um, I just think mm -hmm. we're so lucky to all have all met each other, you included. You know, we just have a great time. Um, I love seeing the Ilk play, so that was a highlight for me because I haven't seen you guys play for a long time, so that was great. For me, it's about, like I say, getting up there. That was the first time, uh, probably the second set that I'd done where I was just doing my own music um, yeah. and I, I did one cover. Uh, just kind of, I always feel like you should do one cover, but um, I, uh, in actual fact, maybe you shouldn't. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, so that uh, genuinely the highlight for me is getting up there and playing, meeting up with all the people that we've met over the t last few years. It's just great. I love getting together with the OM crew anytime I can, you know. Awesome. Cool. And while we, while you were there, I think you mentioned uh, one of your songs, uh, it was the first you'd written specifically to be performed. And I wondered, yeah. like, how, how does how does that differ? So how does writing with performance in mind differ from just writing for, you know, yourself in a bedroom? I think I suppose I've always written since I was young, uh, be it short stories or songs, never really into poetry, but, uh, but yeah, from a writing point of view anyway. But uh, but yeah, I had probably um, I just decided I'd, I'd started to learn the guitar. I was able to play and I thought, Eleanor, come on, this is, you've always loved writing. Do it. Do write a song that you would actually go out and perform. Because I think a lot of the songs I've written in the past, it might just be a bit more of an emotional splurge um, mm -hmm. as opposed to actually building a song, creating. A, and I was very, I've got to be honest, I do write probably from very, I don't know if it's basic or whether it's just normal structure for a song. I'm kind of verses, a bridge and a chorus. Yeah. And, a, you know, it's, uh, so yeah, I kind of pieced it together in that way. Um, and uh, it just, yeah, I don't know. It just felt like I'm I'm writing a song that I'm actually going to go out and do. So I thought a lot more about the words. I thought a lot more about the story, having a story in it, as opposed to just sort of writing like I'd always. I've never yeah. really put too much focus on what I was writing, just wrote. Um, and now I'm going back, actually. I've just pulled out <laughs> some notes today. I've been tidying up and uh, found some old writings, and I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'll make a song out of that now, you know. Yeah. So it's... So it's nice to revisit some of the older stuff as well. Oh, that's cool. And and one of the things I quite like to talk about uh, when I speak to songwriters is that that songwriting process. So is you with you, is it sort of lyrics first, then music, or do they both come at the same time? Or is it music first, or does it totally depend? It really does depend, yeah. I've had scenarios where I've had, I mean, one of my songs that I only wrote at the back end of last year, um, I have had the chorus if you like or the, uh, certainly a melody and two lines mm -hmm. of it in my head for a number of years and I've always I've had the lyrics in my head and all of a sudden I was kind of like okay after all and it all just kind of and I was like oh and then from those two lines 
I wrote the whole song. It's, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it really varies. And another time I'll be sitting playing on the guitar in the evening and I'll come up with some chords that I like and I think, OK, I'm going to try and do something with that. Um, yeah. I'm in the stage of writing at the moment where I want to try and um, develop my songwriting, <laughs> take it away from just writing about personal experience to writing about lots of other things that you say. I'm yeah. always very impressed with people that can put a story together and pull a song or pull some writing out of something that actually is not relative to their life. It's just yeah. an ob observational writing, you know? So uh, yeah. that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. But yeah, it's, uh, no, I, it just changes. I don't know. Sometimes I just start singing a song and I literally have to write it down because yeah. I know it's going to go. Um, and that will be normally about half one in the morning when it's Yeah, so the I worst possible start. times. Yeah, you're in the shower <laughs> or something. You're like, I need a pen, I need a pen. Yeah. <laughs> And well, and um, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. And well, and going back to what you mentioned about your, um, you know, how your your structure of your songs is quite often that sort of typical sort of verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge thing. Yeah. I mean, I think there's there's obviously um, there's a reason why that's a structure in the first place. But I think especially for someone like yourself, or you know, even myself, when I go and play at open mics or wherever I play. Um, you almost want something that's a bit more structured like that because you need you need people to remember you. You know, I think it's once you're yeah. at the stage of like when you're Pink Floyd and everyone's going to buy your album regardless, oh, yeah, you then you can you mess want. around with yeah. structure. But when you're trying to get you know trying to get write a song that's going to sort of stick in people's memories, um, yeah. I think those 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 kind of structures help as a little I suppose a little shortcut. Yeah, I think it's about that's kind of that's kind of the way I've always loved music as well. I like I like how songs. I mean, I'm definitely a story song girl. I'm definitely, mm -hmm. you know, heavily influenced by, the, I suppose, um, my, yeah, probably my parents' music, really. And so yeah. my dad would listen to a lot of John Denver and folky stuff like that. And and those songs were always written that way. And yeah. because yeah. they're nice on my ear, I kind of like, well, that's what I'll do then. Um, but, yeah, I, I am hesitant of being in that trap of just doing the same repeatedly. Um, but then... I've also thought you have to have your sound, don't you? It's yeah. uh, I listen to music and some people I will hear saying, oh, every song sounds the same. Um, in fact, I think Keen are probably a really good band that you could say that about. You mm. could put any Keen song on and you know it's Keen. Um, yeah. But uh, now that can be an annoyance to some people, but then I'm like, that's just their sound, isn't it? That's how yeah, they sound. Yeah. So I, I'm kind of in that indecisive point, point at the moment. I wanted to try and change what I was doing, and then I'm like, maybe I should just trade through to what I do, actually. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's, funny. it's a tough quandary, isn't it? Yeah. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain. I'm here in conversation with Eleanor Morrison Moore, and this is Paul Adams with 47. Woke up on my birthday with a hangover from hell. Never touched a drop last night, but I'm not doing well. Can't believe I'm 47 and I've been through hell. Man, it feels good to be alive. I went for a midday walk, cause I just don't own a car. Been down in that Hillsbury weather, well, I didn't have to get that far. For I heard a clap of thunder and I saw a flash of light. Man, it feels good to be alive. Let the rain fall down on me. You won't hear me complaining, begging, Lord, set me free. Let the rain fall. I stood under a nearby tree and I looked up at the sky I thought about those other years and those friends who've passed me by I held on to the good times, said goodbye to the bad But man, it feels good to be alive Start to do the thing 
to be alive. That was 47 by Paul Adams. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm joined now in conversation by Eleanor Morrison-Moore. And, well, and I wanted to ask you, and this kind of goes back to your, your, I suppose, your early um, sort of forays into music, where that was very much about the music. Is it music or lyrics that speak to you the most? Or again, is that another one that, that depends? Lyrics, lyrics, definitely. And is that 100%. going back to again the 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 storytelling side of things? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Even I mean, look. So I, I've got very sort of like most people, very wide range of genres that I listen to. Um, but the one thing that comes into everything I listen to is words. I'm like, uh, it has to. It doesn't matter if it's Alice Cooper or it's John yeah. Denver it's a story it's a you know something's happening in that there's a theme there's a um and I, I suppose i love country music as well for that same yeah. reason quite often story based you know and that was what i was thinking when you were talking about sort of story based stuff because i was thinking of like thinking thinking of some examples and i was like like the beatles for me they're quite an interesting one because they have yeah. a lot of their like they have their weird stories like things like maxwell silver hammer and stuff where yeah. it's like that's just yeah. an absolutely balmy story but it, it's yeah. still a story and then and the other thing the other person i thought of immediately was uh johnny cash because a lot yeah. of his stuff is very story based. Actually, a lot of Bob yeah. Dylan stuff is story uh, yeah, story based Bob as well. well Johnny, um, yeah, yeah, and they were all yeah. the things I grew up listening to, you know. So it yeah, was, uh... so there's pro probably a reason for that there now that why it's the same for yourself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. Cool. So a couple of questions. I wanted to touch more on like music in general. And I wondered. Uh, so one of the questions I've got written down here is, how do you think music helps to bring people together? Um, I always say, so there's a lyric from a Stevie Wonder song. Uh, it's the only, it, music is a language we all understand. Mm -hmm. That's how music brings people together. It's the only thing that you don't even, you know, you take it, strip it right back to when there was only rhythm and rhythm and vocal uh, in, you know, back in sort of tribes, banging drums and things like that. It, everybody can get into a beat and everybody can get into a melody. So um, I just think it is, it's, uh, I, I feel sorry for anybody that hasn't ever had the ability to hear and to mm. know how wonderful sound is and how um, how it can make you feel. It can change yeah. your mood like that, can't it? You know, it's why yeah. it's used so heavily in the respect of films. They can make you scared in a second. It can make you uplifted in a second. It's, you'll know if you just listen to a piece of music without lyrics, you can tell if it's a happy piece, if it's, mm. a, you know. So, yeah, there's an awful lot of power involved in it and i think that's how it joins people together because uh, there's no i don't know any who doesn't like music in one yeah. way shape or form you know um yeah well it's, it's interesting <laughs> the way you said that as well because if you think about it you know sometimes people then play on that expectation so you'll get a piece of music that sounds really happy but when you listen to the lyrics it's actually really sad or, or yeah, vice versa yeah. um yeah. so so sometimes people rely on the fact that your ear is going to interpret this as a happy piece to yeah. then sort of subvert that as well so it's quite mm -hmm. clever like what people can do with it and again like um i mean a great example for me would be you, you know you mentioned movie soundtracks another one is like video game soundtracks like yeah. um like if i hear the theme from super mario world on the super nintendo it just yeah. takes me back to being like seven years old or whatever it is and um and so it's, it's really interesting yeah. like the, the way that works and again like a tv show themes all of that there's even some things that i've noticed recently so funnily enough, my girlfriend and I, and I have been watching uh, SpongeBob SquarePants because I'd never seen it, and she no, she has yeah. like she has like nostalgic memories of it. So we put it on before we go to <laughs> sleep because it's just like perfect like background stuff. But there, a couple of times I've been watching that and I've been like, I recognise that music. And like last night we That's were watching it. it, and I recognised yeah. a piece of music from it, and I was like, that was actually it was used in um uh, that Mitchell and Webb look like the a comedy sketch show, but they yeah. used it for oh, similar well. purposes. It's like this like dastardly theme of like the villain is up <laughs> to no good. And I was just I just find it interesting when I when I spot that and I'm like that same piece of music has been used yeah. elsewhere. And I and guess in, like in another a similar scenario as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like and and it can even become like almost a cliche. Like if you think of um uh you know the 2001 a space odyssey and i think it's uh, the spake zarathustra i think it's called and that like yeah, duh, yeah. Duh, duh, duh. and like that's yeah. been parodied so many times and if you think Absolutely. about that that's yeah. that's just five notes and like that speaks yeah. volumes to people when they hear it so it's, it's kind of cool the, the way that we use it that you come across some people that could sing about anything but 
deliver such a performance and emotion that you get drawn yeah. into it. Uh, so yeah, no, I, I for me that comes down to the person performing it and how the emotion that they are able to extract and put into that themselves. Um, because I have, I've been to see bands or artists that I thought would be amazing because their music's amazing, but actually mm. from a performance point of view, didn't enjoy it. And then I've yeah. equally gone to things that I thought, mm, I don't know, I'll go along and see and been blown away by it. So it's, uh, and that's generally because of the level of emotion that you get out of some, someone's or someone's performance. So, Yeah, for sure. And I think it's like a common thing. I mean, I'm sure you do the same as me, but I think most people who, who are into music and who are into live music in particular, like whenever I'm in a new city or something, I'm just like, right, we've got to go and see some live music. I don't care what it is. I don't care what genre it is or anything like that. Because again, <laughs> you have those surprises where you're like, oh, actually, I went to see this estonian fiddle yeah. band and they were amazing and i totally yeah. wasn't expecting it and i just went along because there was live music and that's all you need you know yeah. um but i wanted to ask as well um with you coming back to you performing mostly your originals do you think that helps for you as a performer to then again share that emotion uh to, to be performing the original songs that you wrote yourself rather than yeah. trying to match someone else's okay. emotion yeah i do i would so i would there's part of me that would love to write for other people Mm. um but yes i would probably then tailor it more towards them so that there is your answer isn't it it's, yeah yeah they're very much um and i i do try and put emotion into my songs but i'm so i, I still find as a performer on the guitar there's still an element of um i think i may hold back a little bit on myself uh because of nerves you know i'm still yeah. tr learning to manage the nerves when playing on my own uh yeah. so if i want to if it's sing on my own or sing with the girls i not even a nerve in sight i just love it um yeah. but the minute i'm responsible for a guitar and a vocal and then making sure that i get my words right and my delivery it puts a lot of pressure i find that a lot of pressure yeah. so um, but yeah, I always try and put a lot of uh, emotion into it. And I always try and write with that, say, you know, with emotion, because if it doesn't come from that place, then you're not going to be able to put it in in the performance, I don't think. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Um, and just the last one to end on, it's sort of two in one. So uh, what have you got planned next and where can people follow you to find out more? Uh, so this is a bad thing, isn't it? I don't have a music page. Um, I tell you what, I'll start up a, a, a music page because I've been meaning to do that for a very long time and I'll send you the link and then awesome. you'll know, I'll know where you can follow me at. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, what am I doing next? My next gig is, because I'm on holiday at the moment for two weeks, uh, which I've banned all music and everything. I'm just, I'm off work and I'm nice. having fun and we're off to Norfolk next week. Um, my next gig is a Boogie Boogie Bellas one, and that is 27th of... No, it's not. It's the 26th of May um, <laughs> in Vista at the Heritage Club. It's a variety showcase, and we're the special guests there, so really cool. looking forward to that one. And the next one on the guitar, I think, is... Well, to be fair, I'll be at an open mic on Thursday. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm going to try... <laughs> Uh, tomorrow night, I'm going to try and come down to Amersham. I've not done the Mad Squirrel before, so I thought I'd cool. try and do that. Um, I'm just trying to think. I'd have to look at my calendar to look at my next yeah. gig. I'm useless. This is why I need to get a music page. <laughs> yeah, get your page set up and people can find out from there. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. So that was a wasted question, wasn't it, Dane? <laughs> no, no, it's all good. All good. Big thank you to Eleanor Morrison Moore for joining me. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Luna Barge with Tube Song. Jeans go tumbling past me This platform keeps winding along We're following dots on the map Can I sit on your lap While this carriage keeps drumming its song I'm reading the headlines of the Sydney Don't think I'll quite fit I'll stand till I feel like a drop Just a muddle of hairstyles and coffee
la 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 All of these people on their journey through life And we don't know where they be Some of them are rushing and some take it slow But we just keep our own speed You're listening to the Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound I'm your host Dane Cobain And it's time for us to head over to the Elk Shed now To catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review PJ Harvey, stories from the city, stories from the sea. PJ Harvey is a female singer-songwriter from the West Country. These are words which would make me picture a winsome cottagecore waif, picking or gently strumming an acoustic guitar. But Polly Jean is actually a fearsome femme fatale rock chick that bangs away at a distorted electric guitar with the basic backing of a bass player and a drummer. It is White Stripes basic and grungy. It sounds a bit like Patti Smith fronting the Stooges. There is a great song on this album called This Is Love. It is a PJ Harvey classic that is exactly what you would have expected from her when this album came out. However, I can remember taking this CD out of the library because I was hooked on the track Good Fortune, which has Beatles-esque harmonies. Generally, this album smoothed out her sound. There are muted guitars that are not distorted, and there are songs with a chiming orchestra of multi-tracked guitars. It is a very good-sounding album, and one track has her doing a duet with Tom York of Radiohead. And I was really into Radiohead at the time, and that is maybe also why I bought this CD in the library sale. And it would probably have only cost me £2. I would also not hesitate to buy any of her other CDs if I found them in charity shops. PJ Harvey, Stories from the City, Stories from the Sea. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to Eleanor Morrison Moore for being this week's guest. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You should be able to find us. We're repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights or on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a little review on your podcast provider of choice. And you can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I'd love to hear from you. So, I'm going to leave you with one last tune until next week. This is The Altered Mindset with Same Street. I'll catch you next time. Stuck in the middle You try to